So, welcome back, as I said. Um, I am going to talk about commissioning, and I am going to talk about real life experiences, but I'm going to base it very much around demand controlled ventilation. Uh, because that's something that's really quite important, I think, in the way that we look and how we design our buildings today. So, the work I'm going to go through comes from Norway, a lot of it, on the basis. A couple of guys called Matt Meeson and Pete Shield. They're the guys who really did most of the work for this. If I'm being honest, I sort of came in at the 11th hour helped them with the English translation, gave them my experience, my feedback, and uh, they very kindly put my name on the paper. <laughs> but I have to be honest, it is mainly their work. And of course, Swigon did actually support that work with Swigon Norway uh, for many years. So a little bit about myself. My name is John Woolett. I'm a chartered engineer and because of the sort of work I've been doing for Swigon for the past 12 years, I get to have all these fantastic letters after my name, which just means I do a lot of voluntary work for these organisations. We find people like Carlos. Um, I started off um, working in the HVAC field when I moved to Sweden uh, and got a job with Swigon. I worked with research and development with air handling units in our factory in Kerena. Uh, I then went on to run the Swigon Air Academy. So some of you I've probably seen before as well, since passing the baton on over to Petra. Um, and for the past year, I've had a quite fascinating experience. I've been working in London. Now although I come from there, I've never worked there before, not in the edge back field. So all of a sudden I'm faced as someone with quite a lot of years of experience in HVAC getting out on the street, meeting consultants, architects, maintenance engineers, and finding out what the real problems are. And that's been a very, very fascinating experience. Um, and so I, I do like looking at demand control ventilation systems, and both on, on air side and water side, and I think we do have a lot of energy saving potential there. Um, and as Carl said, I'd also uh, helped out with the chill beam application guidance there. So that's a little bit about myself. I also want to understand a little bit about you. I'd like to know which of you here today are students or in the academic <coughs> world, so please put your hand up if you're studying or an academic. Good, then we can keep things real life. <laughs> so how many of you are architects? Oh, what a shame, is no one admitting to being an architect? Or, uh, there are none here. Good, because architects I have a bit of a problem with sometimes. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I gather from the, the chuckles in the room that you also have your run-ins with them occasionally. Um, fantastically talented people, but we need to keep them close to terra firma. So most of you, I assume, are consulting engineers, or are mechanical design engineers of some description. Am I right? Yes, not ahead. And we have, so I know we have at least one operations engineer here today, so hopefully a few more people to do with facility management as well. So what I want to go through today are these, these points. I want to very quickly define demand control ventilation. And I will do it fairly quickly because I think most of you actually know what this is, as most of the work in defining what demand control ventilation is has come actually from Estonians. So I assume you actually know that probably better than I do. I'm going to go through why it's important in respect to energy policy, because I want to put it in context to where we are today, almost at the geopolitical level, because I want you to understand why this is important for our profession, what our little bit that we can do to try and reach lower energy levels. I'm going to look at some practical applications very quickly go through some different sensor technologies because I think this is good advice that I can pass on to you. And then we're going to look at commissioning and how we document the projects, very important there for, for the operation engineers here. And then how DCV can help 
with maybe some basic energy performance contracting EPCs. Just a little idea there. So they're the, the eight points I want to cover. Any questions on any of those points? I can see the, uh, the, the excitement in your eyes already. So, what is demand controlled ventilation? And you know, this is something which I think is lost, and I've seen this unfortunately, it's lost in a lot of the people that I've been meeting in London. Why do we have ventilation? It's for us. We make buildings for us, for people, to feel good in and to have a sense of well-being within them. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of buildings out there that really make us sick or don't actually increase our life quality in some way. Uh, and that's probably why sometimes I have the biggest problem with architects, because I think maybe their ego is getting in the way of what's actually important and making buildings which are good for us. But the long control ventilation can actually help because it doesn't actually detract from comfort and well-being. We know that we have to dimension for these constant air volumes. We know we have that peak. And we know we can reduce that. We know for, for example, a basic VAV system, that people do go home generally at night time and sleep, so they're not at the office or at the school. But as Carl said earlier, research shows that actually, even during the working day, we're mainly operating, or maybe operating, <coughs> approximately maybe 35%, 40% capacity. So some sort of demand control ventilation could really reduce our energy consumption or energy use even further. So what makes DCV different? What is the key point? According to the European standard or European norms, this is the definition. So a ventilation system where the ventilation rate is controlled by air quality or moisture and or occupancy and some other indicator for the need of ventilation. That's the thing that really sets it about and sets it apart. It's the sensing. It's the information feedback to the system, which maybe these other two don't have. The consequence of that is that if we look at the demand control system and the blue line where is airflow rate, which can actually supply it, that say three cubic meters a second, if it needs to, most of the year, it's actually operating at a much lower rate. You can see where the CAB system is, it has to run at three cubic meters a second all year. So consequently, the energy signature <coughs> is also much higher. So I know you understand that, and I know you've seen this before. But I just wanted to bring that in at the beginning, just so we understood where we were. So if we put this into context of climate change and energy policy, uh, the International Panel for Climate Change wants to see a 50% reduction against 1990 levels of man-made CO2 emissions before 2050. You have already seen that the F-gas legislation within Europe is coming very hard against refrigerants, which are very bad for uh, global warming. That is already impacting you today, and if you don't actually know anything about that, you should definitely have a chat with Ingrid later and make sure she can come to us with the information. Um, we're also looking at how we can reduce the energy sector of buildings. For European member states on the, who, who own government buildings, they have to be at the forefront. They're the ones that have to perform better than any privately owned building. So the Estonian uh, governmental buildings will be looking by 2019 to be at, you know, at, at showcases for everybody else in terms of energy performance and climate, indoor climate. We have this vision of near zero energy buildings by 2020, which I know you're aware of already as well. I know we've had lectures about this here in Estonia. So really, the situation we're at today as HVAC or building service professionals is that ventilation constitutes a major share of the total energy use in buildings. So we, we estimate in the Nordic countries that typically 35 to 50% for office buildings. So 
in our industry and what we do, we can have a huge impact on the energy signature. You agree with me? Good, a few nodding heads, heads, great. So, why demand control ventilation? I think you'll agree that most of our building stock is already here. We're not going to see a huge um, increase in, in building uh, in the next few years. Most of yields buildings are already here, so we have to deal with what we've got. Now, if I just look at my own home at the moment, where I'm desperately trying to get a supply and extract ventilation system put in, it's not very easy, actually, to get duct work into an old building. It's quite difficult to actually get it to fit in. So if we use demand control ventilation, maybe we can actually get it into fit to smaller gaps than we would not with. We may have limited physical space to deal with. Um, so a lot of these buildings aren't suitable for very large ducting, low pressure drop systems, which have the lowest energy uh, signature or SFP. We have to find some other way of getting that in, getting the duct work in. So we use technology like demand control ventilation, like sensing equipment in the occupied spaces to make sure we only deliver what we need to deliver when we need to deliver it. So is that an efficient use of energy? I would say yes. Are we compromising on IAQ? Absolutely not. And that's really important. We do not want to compromise on the indoor air quality. So unless it's some sort of process, um, process ventilation, then I would say it's questionable to use CAV systems in ventilation systems in buildings today. I think we really should be looking at some sort of demand control. So I want to just go through what is, what is a basic system. And for me, this is sort of like the basic way of describing the supply side of the demand control ventilation system. You have this static pressure um, reader or uh, sensor, normally about two thirds along the, the main spur of the ductwork, and you have to feed that back to a pressure controller, which then influences the variable speed drive. And then these dampers are able to you know, sense what's going on in the occupy space and make decisions on how much air it wants to, wants to supply. And then that obviously changes the, uh, the, the pressure in the main ductwork, and the, the pressure can then reset itself according to what is uh, required. So it always keeps a constant pressure. That's the simplest way of going about it. So, you all work with SFP all the time. And as all of you know, basically all that's showing there is that the SFP is the sum of all the powers um, over the airflow with respect to time. And if we're looking, if we relate everything to constant air volume, that red line at the top, that would represent a constant air volume system. So if we say that's our baseline, any system that is demand control will come in underneath that. And I'll go through what I consider to be normal, good, and ideal. And I guess you can say the theoretical, um, sort of the best case you could get, and you'll probably never get to, because theoretically where you could get to is this R squared line here. But it's absolutely feasible to end up in this sort of area, which in every single case is much better than the CAV system. So I'm going to refer to this graph a little bit more, okay? I'll probably click back to it. So if we look at the, the basic equation for working out energy use for fans, as you all know, you know, we're looking at airflow rate, we can tie that by the SFP, and then we just want to know how many hours a year are we using this? You multiply those together, you can then get your energy use for the year. It's not rocket science and you probably use this form of this sort of stuff day in, day out. So, if we were to use that and actually put some figures in, say that I've got a system that uses 10 cubic meters an hour for each meter squared of the building, and I've got an SFP of two, quite a good SFP by today's standard. I think uh, most of the projects I'm working with in London now have an SFP of not more than 2.1. So it's within the building regs that I'm familiar with. 
And say you're using that for about 3,000 hours a year. You could say that you're getting 17 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. Now, whether the, the, the figures I'm using are, are accurate or not makes no difference really. It's more to do with comparison. So I just want to use this as a baseline comparison. I've also put just a simple uh, analysis of where I think my, my heat consumption would be or what I'll be using there. And I've just used the delta T of 3 degrees Celsius. Again, I've used the airflow of 10 meters cubed per hour per meter squared. Uh, and I'm saying that I'm operating that for maybe, I need heating for maybe about 1,000 hours instead of what I need for the ventilation, which is 3,000 hours a year. And say that comes out with about 10 kilowatt hours per meter squared a year. So maybe that's the, what we could say we have for a CAV system. So if I start now looking at a, a demand control system again, I've got my, as I say, my static pressure point, I'm controlling that, I'm then looking at how each single branch can then optimize it on what's going on inside the space. If I now go and I put that system in, instead of a CAV system, what does that happen when we look at the calculations? So now, instead of being up here, I'm now going to look at cases where we're looking at the yellow line, the green one there, uh, and we can start to see how the energy performance improves. So this was my CAV system, and there were the two figures, 17 and 10. If I go for a constant pressure demand control ventilation system, then say that I'm going down to 80% of that maximum. So now I take my um, volume, air volume down to 8 cubic meters, now, so now I've changed that to 8. My SFP has correspondingly gone down as well to 80%. So I'm taking it down to 1.6. I'm still operating the same number of hours, but my total energy usage has now dropped to 8 to 11 kilowatt hours. In that sort of region, you'd expect that you know, ballpark figure to come out to, which compares straight away to 17. I think it's quite an improvement. And if we look also on the heating side, we've gone down to 6 to 8 kilowatt hours per meter squared a year instead of 10. So there's savings on both heating energy and also on the ventilation energy. And that's just maybe by taking on the more simple demand control ventilation systems. So real practical energy savings for the building owner or the person who pays the energy bills. Again, if I take that down to 0.6, then again, contra to the CAV system, you can now say I've gone down to say four kilowatt hours per square year and six. So there are real tangible savings to be had from looking how we can vary the amount of air volume we put in. And this, to be honest, if I hadn't been working in London, I probably wouldn't have spared any time talking to you about this because I'd have thought you guys would know this. And I don't mean you guys sitting in the room here today. I just remember I was talking to a consultancy in London three or four weeks ago. And I said to him, you know, you really should look at putting the demand control system in here. Now he said, we want to go with CAV. You know, VAV, uh, DCV, so 1990s, nobody's doing that anymore. <laughs> and I didn't know really what to say to that. Uh, but I did get a little bit concerned, let's put it that way, and, and try to use my powers of persuasion that, that maybe um, saving energy is still rather relevant today and should be taken quite seriously. I think that's more, maybe more of a skewed view of the way that London is at the moment, where uh, the price per square metre, what you can rent out for, uh, the price you can rent out for, is the deciding factor rather than how much uh, energy a square meter actually takes to run. I think it's more of a consequence of that. Um, so if we just go with that, there was a couple guys who did, um, who, who concluded uh, what they found uh, from, uh, from different experiences of running pressure controlled DCB systems. I just want to run through a few of them with you. Um, so they did say that they were looking at quite high any uh, found, found energy usage compared with uh, uh, static pressure reset, which I'll get to later. So, you know, it isn't the best demand control system you can have, but, you know, it's getting there. 
Um, they did say they had an often problematic function with this, and I'm actually going to show you a case study in a minute, which actually demonstrates maybe some of the errors that can happen. Sensors don't capture the change in the space. Again, I'm going to go through a, an example of where that can happen. It could even happen in this room, because I don't know if you noticed, but when I was sitting at the back, you see that guy out there in the corner, that red light comes on occasionally? That's obviously an occupancy sensor. Well, that occupancy sensor doesn't care if it's just me running backwards and forwards in this room, or whether we're all sat here together. It just says, this room is occupied. But if we don't argument that, if we don't add something else to that, it's really quite a useless or limited use to us. We can actually get unfavorable positioning of the duct pressure sensor. And that happens quite often. The installer comes along, ah, oh, this is about two turns out, stick it in there. But maybe there's actually a bend in the ductwork just before, so you're actually getting uneven airflow over that, uh, that static pressure sensor. You know, for you and I, we know about these problems. But if the guy who's installing it doesn't know where to put it, it can all go horribly wrong. So, as I said, you know, that stable pressure uh, and development of velocity profile, i.e. not around the corner, is very important. So that correct position you know, is important, but it can also vary. You know, what is the correct position in one running mode may not be the correct another. So it's always a compromise, but you need to be aware of this. So, a real life experience. Actually, this is from this week. A consultant, a friend of mine, called me up and said, John, we've got a problem. Um, I'm not going to say whose kid this is, but I think you may recognize it. So, this air handling unit, I don't know if you can see it here, this is what the fan's doing, and I don't know if you can read at the back, that says it's, it's not running at all, it's actually stopped running. It should be running, but it's stopped. So, the people come in the office in the morning, it doesn't feel very nice, it's, you know, it's, it's not warm, it's, it's cold, and there's no air. So they bring up the consultant and say, what's going on with this system, why is it stopped? So they get the maintenance guy along, who knows a little bit, he can see that there's an alarm there, goes in, supply air temperature below set point alarm limit. What that's basically telling you is that the air handling unit has said, I cannot physically heat up the air to where you want to get it to. So I'm not going to deliver any air because it will just make it colder. So I'm going to stop. So the air handling unit has been quite smart here. It said, if I turn on, I'm going to make things worse for you. So I'm just going to stop. That's quite nice if you understand why that's happening, because there should be something going on there. So they clear the alarm, they start it up again, and the first thing you notice is that, is that for some reason, this has been set up to supply air at 2.35 cubic meters a second, but it's extracting at 1.4. It's unbalanced airflow. There has actually been complaints in this building, which is extremely airtight, is actually classified as a passive house. They've actually had this weird, eerie sound coming from the building. And of course, that's the air being sucked through every minuscule little hole that you can find in the building fabric to try and make up that loss of air. So whoever's actually you know, put this into place hasn't looked at how this is actually being um, run. Now, I'm also told in this system that it should look like this. There's a static pressure tube, it goes back to the controller and varies the variable speed drive, right? This is the basic VAB system, or the demand control ventilation system. And there should be three VAB boxes on each spur. Now, I don't know if you have this phrase in Estonian, but we have something in the UK called value engineering. I don't know how to translate that into Estonian. But it has nothing to do with value, and it has nothing to do with engineering. It has everything to do with cost cutting. So the installer, in his wisdom, or her wisdom, came along and said, we don't need those. I'm going to take those out, it's a waste of money. So they're not there. Unfortunately, they didn't tell the designer that they were taking them out. So the designer still believes that they're in place. 
There's also no static pressure tube in the duct work. So it doesn't know. We, we did, I think that was just laying on the floor somewhere from what I understood. It wasn't even, it was just measuring whatever the pressure was in the space, but not in the duct work. So no wonder this poor little air handling unit was getting a bit confused and trying to protect its occupants as best it could, but was really getting false information. So I guess I can, the only thing I can say with here is it doesn't matter how well you design a system, you can still get sabotaged by a bad installer. Uh, without a doubt, it can happen. However, I'm now told that they have actually put that static pressure tube back in, so where it should be. They can't do anything about that, but at least it's running to a static pressure, and now they can actually vary it over time. So they can say, people aren't here in the evening, we're going to run that down. And they're actually going to put an air quality sensor in there as well. So it can actually go on air quality, and it will be able to go on the static pressure to maintain that. Um, it's not going to be ideal, we're not going to save the planet with systems like this, but at least the people won't be freezing inside their house. So, this is the system I spoke about earlier with the um, uh, static pressure reset. This is much more of what I like to see. Because here, we're actually getting direct information from each spur about what's going on in terms of pressure in each area. You get a lot more visibility, a lot more feedback to the air handling about what's going on, what's my status, what is the critical path. Because with demand control ventilation, what you're trying to do obviously is keep at least one critical path open. One spur should be fully open. That's what you're trying to get to. The others may be throttling back a little bit. These may be that one may be closed, this one may be, this is our critical path at the moment because it's, that's the one that's most open and this one is throttling a little bit. So as long as we've got one critical path always open, that's our, that's our goal. And again, this is just another way of getting towards the optimum pressure where we actually start putting pressure sensors in various points. So here I've got pressure sensors not only in the main spur, quite close to the air handling unit, but I've also got it further out, uh, reporting back. And I've also got reports from every single um, zone damper. It's just a variation of what you saw earlier, but this is with supply and extract, uh, and just a little bit more information, a little bit more visibility. And then that little control up there can then make the decision, what do I need to set my static pressure for? Do I need to race a little bit because there's one person right at the, the far end still working and everybody else has gone home? Or is everybody here and can I open up everything? Now, this in theory looks like quite a good idea. And this maybe represents the problem with this guy up here in the corner. So this, it looks like we have good visibility, right? It looks like we have a situation where every single uh, spur is actually reporting back its status and what's going on. Now this is a real life example again where they were measuring in one of these rooms out here um, the, D, uh, the DCB diffuser was saying I'm open and I'm giving, I, I, I'm at where I should be for my maximum airflow. The air handling unit was saying yeah I'm delivering that air as well no problem but for some reason out here it wasn't getting the air it needed. Now in this case the only thing that was reported back was there's somebody in the room. Didn't know if it was one, five, or ten. So it was going up to its maximum, but it couldn't really say what was going on in there. It had no air quality sensor. When they actually discovered what was going on, they found that this was the situation. So basically, they are probably a lot of their air is going into that void. But they couldn't get that visibility at the beginning to find out what was going on because of this installation error. Um, and this you could call, I guess it gets called digital demand control ventilation. It's not meant to sound uh, grand or anything, it's just sort of a, a one zero sort of thing. Uh, you know, that thing like it says, there's somebody here, there's nobody here, but nothing in between. Um, so, you know, it needs to be given that 
the, uh, that we can compensate for the errors and failure notifications is like blue channel leakage. Um, you know, and this may, in Norway, they, they get a little bit worried about this. You know, what is the employer's liability for actually supplying the air quality that's required for employees? Uh, that's quite a heavy thing uh, there. Uh, so, you know, how, how do you actually safeguard? I guess the, the maintenance engineer uh, in the room needs to really be on top of their game uh, there. Um, we need to be able to easily modify airflows. You know, if you if you know that, that this room tomorrow is going to be used as just a single occupancy office, or we're going to put you know six cubicles in here instead of a conference room, can we change that easily? Um, so you know, do we need to change also for you know for, for the guy who's working overtime at the end, you know, within normal working hours? How do we how do we change that um, that that minimum supply level for, for different working hours as well. It needs to be something needs to take a consideration of. So in this case I would say that uh, if we're looking at uh, you know percentage of CAV again CAV would be you know our, our maximum value there. But demand control ventilation in comparison to uh, uh, CAV in, in the infrared the occupancy uh, set, um, sensor you know it, it is an improvement. It is an improvement, but it's still not as good as using air quality as a sensor. I normally recommend using air quality and temperature as, as two, as two, uh, as two um, variables you need to put in, and maybe occupancy as well if you really want uh, three, but I wouldn't run just for occupancy. So let's have a look at the type of sensors. Um, obviously, you can just put a clock on it. Comes on at seven o'clock in the morning, goes off at five. You're still there working after that, tough. We can have occupancy, um, the low cost, great lifespan, but not very good resolution. We can look at um, CO2 concentration. Um, a lot of people still like that. A lot of the standards relate to CO2, uh, but using that as a proxy, I think, I personally think we're coming away from. Uh, I think we're going much more towards uh, VOC sensors. They actually give a much better indication of the air quality, I believe, uh, and also is able to decide whether the air quality outside is actually as good as what you've got inside already. So maybe some really polluted places like China, you might actually say, you know what, at the moment, the air pollution outside has got so bad, we need to go into research because the air is cleaner in here because that air outside is not fresh air. You can call it supply air, but it's not fresh. If any of you have been to Beijing in the autumn, yeah, nasty. Um, and of course, temperature sensors as well. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's a good I think, with thermostatic uh, uh, temperatures. Um, I did go into requirements of CO2 sensors, but you could say a lot of these probably refer to uh, general air quality. Um, sensing in, in the space, but you know there are a, a load of requirements you have to go through to do with you know how, how reliable is it in terms of a sensor, you know how long will it last, how how accurate is it, um, you know how can I calibrate this, how can I ensure that this is still within its tolerance, and you know, what sort of strategies are there for that, and you know there are part of these are written down in, in the European standards so that manufacturers have a chance to um, to actually look at what they're specifying. Um, and also, you know, where do I put it? Where's the most optimal place? Should I put it in the return air duct? Should I put it on the wall? Um, you know, what, what is, where should I be putting this to get the best resolution in the space? And how do we fix that into the control system? So I did promise that I would uh, talk a bit more about commissioning and um, I actually took the liberty of actually talking to one of the, the, the Swigon commissioning engineers uh, and he did say that when a customer actually uh, wants to talk to uh, or, or use the facilities of a, of a commissioning engineer, which isn't always the case, uh, but when they do, this is the sort of uh, check they need to go through. So they will do a function check uh, at a room level and they'll then go through to, uh, to the zone. So they'll work from the occupied zone and go backwards. Uh, and then straight back to the, or eventually back to the air, air handling unit. And they do measure the SFPs. 
And I'm sure you know this is what any good commissioning engineer is going to go around and do. Um, so you know, if you get full visibility, you can reduce the amount of maintenance without a doubt. I think that's a, that's a fairly common sense approach. Um, in this report that Mads and uh, Peter uh, did, there is actually a um, Yeah, actually, one year, one year after after inspection, there should be a follow-up. And I think actually, uh, for example, in Sweden now, that's actually we have to do that, don't we? Yeah. So there is actually one year. I don't know if we have to do that here in Estonia, but there's actually a legal requirement for that one year. Come back afterwards and check everything's still going. Um, so now I'm actually going to go through the one that, that say Max and uh, Max and Peter went through from Sintef, and this is all in Norwegian, but um, this is their protocol. This is their um, the form that they would want commissioning engineers to use when they go through and check a building. And they call it a max, max, min, and min, min, max way of doing commissioning. Um, if I send that very fast, it could get very confusing. So, again, what they expect the commissioning engineer to do, they would say, they would say, okay, let's put all the DCB diffusers to maximum in a particular zone that they're working on. And then they will then set the air handling unit to supply the maximum amount of air required for that zone. All the rest are set down to, to, to minimum, but that zone we're going to concentrate on. And we're going to go through to every single diffuser and we're going to check, am I getting the airflow that I need to? You know you're getting the airflow because you've just measured the pressure, right? And you want to apply by back and the aggressor, you get your airflow ready. Um, they will then recall the maximum airflows, but they'll then actually set them all to, to minimum uh, and recall those airflows as well, um, even though the air handling unit is still a, um, a maximum airflow. And they repeat that for all the rooms. So that's why it's called in the beginning a max, max, min. Now, what you've got to do is then set your air handling unit down to, well, once you've done that in every single zone in the building where the air handling unit is supplying the maximum amount of air, once you've done that, you set your air handling unit to a minimum. So what is the, the, not the hygienic flow rate anymore for, for human occupants, but what does it need to supply just for the amount of square meters you have in the building? So set it to that. And then they'll go through and they'll check the minimum airflow for all those diffusers again. And then they'll go through and they'll check, can I actually reach maximum airflow in one, on one diffuser? So if you are that last person at the office, and everybody else has gone home, and you've got to work late, can I still get the amount of air I need in that space? Can I still do that? Can I actually still maintain that? So I think that's quite an interesting check as well. So you actually end up in the end with all those columns built in for maximum and minimum air flows. And then you test it one at a time. So if you've done the commissioning right, you'll have a very good idea has it not only been designed correctly, which of course it has, uh, has the correct equipment been not only purchased but installed correctly? Is the ductwork there as it should be or the sensors where they should be? So again, I just wanted to, um, to go through exactly what this maybe means in financial terms and I, I thought it would be interesting to just bring up a a very, very quick example from an energy performance contracting perspective. And as I was talking with some of the people here today during the coffee break, there are some, some real horrendous uh, examples of energy performance contracting. But there are actually some, some, some smaller ones which could actually be quite, quite interesting, could be a good way for insulation companies to actually maybe see a way of adding value to their, customer, to their customers. So one idea uh, was to have this uh, energy performance contract so that you have to supply an SFP of two on the air handling system. And if there's deviation from that, there's compensation both ways. So if the installer has managed to put everything in place and he says, you know what, I can actually get this a little bit lower than what's actually designed, then maybe he'll get some money back. Or if it's the other way around, if the facility management is actually not running this as well as it should be, then maybe they can actually get some money back or they can actually you know, pay for the mistakes they're making. 
Um, so if you deliver a plant with uh, SFP of 1.6, and you're running at 10,000 hours, um, two kilometers an hour, uh, and running time is 3,000 hours, then how much could you be expected to maybe get back? So again, just using the simple equation we had earlier, airflow, SFP, operating time, using energy use, then, if we just look at the amount of cubic meters an hour we're running, the reduction in SFP that we've achieved over the amount of hours, well that's how many kilowatt hours a year that people are saving on that. So, assuming, I think in this case it's in Norwegian crowns, but you know, you could say that's a euro instead for a kilowatt hour, uh, you know, you're looking at you know, over 3,000 euros. Just an interesting thought that the guys at SINs have had about how you could present this and how you can actually make this um, you know, more visible um, by monetizing it. So just to conclude, um, yes, we do want to get the, uh, the control, but this is our control capacity, this is, our, this is what we need to be able to get to, and that's what a CAV system would be, uh, would be dimension for. But we really want to try and be able to get it into that area if we do our commissioning right, if we do our design right, then that's what we can get to. Um, I, I don't, this is sort of the dull bit, <laughs> in some ways the documentation, but this is so damn important. There's my maintenance engineer friend over sitting in the corner there, when he needs to look at something that's gone wrong, or a sensor that isn't there, if he hasn't got the documentation, the drawings that aren't with the building, He's really got a really hard time. And I don't know again what the problem is, what the deal is in Estonia, but if I look at what the legal requirements are in the UK, for example, um, manufacturers need to leave documentation on the equipment supply. But as far as I'm aware, and I'm quite happy to be corrected at some point in the future, but I don't believe they actually have to legally require to give actual sensor uh, placements and, and drawings. I think it's only a legal requirement for equipment information. But we have manuals. But I think it's very important to leave documentation behind. Um, so, you know, levels of airflow, where is that pressure sensor up in the void somewhere? Where, where did we put that? You know, because it's not working now and you need to replace it. Um, and, you know, what, what sort of functionality are we looking for zone dampers? And just make sure that everything's got its markings on it. <laughs> so, actually, I believe this is the building you work in. Uh, so this would be sort of a, uh, um, a good example of what you expect to be handed over to the maintenance team of that building. With all the um, uh, sort of product, you know, all, the, all, all the information you could possibly want from a maintenance engineer to find out about. And that will protect us over time. So. I guess um, some basic tips if you are designing for DCB and you haven't done so before. Um, please start planning for it from the first step. Don't try and convert a CAB system into a DCB system later on. Probably won't enhance your chances of success. Um, of course you want to have balanced supply and extract. And if you're putting extract in one area and you haven't got transfer grills, um, because you're and you're extracting somewhere else, you're going to be you're going to get into trouble with that. Uh, and I have seen that. So transfer grills are missed out quite often if you're extracting from another area. Some rooms do need to have CAB. Maybe the uh, the washrooms need to have a CAB system. So you know which ones are they going to have that? You know, which don't, don't try and put that in afterwards. Try and think forwards. You know where where are we actually going to put those? Uh, and what what how does that affect my base ventilation rate? And how are we going to solve those main ducting issues? Because we don't want a convoluted route that goes all the way through the building. Can we actually have a nice, straight, large air volume that I can get through on a new building, on a, on a, on a um, renovation? Maybe that's not possible. Uh, but I think that's very important to try and get that sorted out as early as possible. Uh, and then, am I able to actually select a smaller air handling unit or air handling system? Because I know that I'm not going to have everybody in this building at the same time. Can I reduce? Or do I still need the full dimension that is there handling unit? There may be a way to save me some money on, it, on, it, on equipment cost at that point by selecting a smaller unit. 
small uh, plant quickly. Um, I guess a wish list for the future, from my side, uh, is that I want to be able to see more self, uh, smart functions, uh, more ability for self-optimization, maybe self-calibration, uh, for both uh, temperature pressure, but also for air quality, I would say. Weather control is something that I'm a little bit skeptical about. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, the consultant team Gothenburg, he actually did his uh, He's um, halfway as well as a doctor. He, uh, he did it with uh, the National uh, Swedish Meteorological Institute, and they were selling weather data to try and say, you know, we're selling the weather data so you can predict what your what your building's going to be doing, uh, and we can tell you when to raise the heating or, or lower it because there's a heat wave or you know a cold spell coming. He actually found out that if they actually replaced the uh, the radiator valves. Uh, to ones which actually worked and were modern, uh, that that had a greater impact on energy efficiency rather than telling you what the weather's going to be like sort of four or five hours in advance. Um, that wasn't the result they were looking for, but you can't always make the research fit what you want. So, but maybe there is some, some room for that once we know that we can control the system more accurately. Um, I think we are getting there, but CAD software can simulate uh, and calculate CAD with um, uh, with a lot of the, the CAD programs now today. They are getting there. I still think we're a little way off, uh, but I am getting more and more requests for um, uh, smart 3D CAD models, which actually have you know SFP uh, airflow ranges and uh, in the internal pressure drops as well. Uh, I'm also wondering if we should have some sort of uh, IAQ indicator within the space. Some people think that's not particularly helpful um, because really if the system's working properly, it should actually, you shouldn't have to worry about the IQ because it should be working fine. But maybe it gives an early indication that something's not quite right either. So, uh, double-edged sword on that one. Jury's out, but yeah, it could be useful. But we really don't want to make things more complicated than they need to be doing. Um, I guess in conclusion, I think that the main point there for me would be, yes, we need to design from the beginning, but I think this one, you know, what, what is that building going to be useful in the, in the future? What other applications could we have here? How can we make this future proof? And I know that you guys think about this a lot anyway, but maybe there's some things we can consider, say, well, you know, after five, ten years' time, if they're still going to keep the infrastructure in, the infrastructure in place and this goes through the use, how can I make this as my, my design as robust as possible? So I would just like to say, yes, it is you know, relatively easy. Um, doesn't need to be overcomplicated. Uh, and we can reduce energy usage without compromising indoor air quality. And as a final point, I just want to show you something which, uh, this will be on the, on the uh, PDF. But this is the original um, uh, book, if you like, uh, that comes from CINTEF. It is in English. Sorry, it's not Estonian. You can get it in Norwegian as well if you so wish. But if you want to learn a lot more about the commissioning routines and you want to get hold of a copy of that commissioning chart, then it's all in this and it's all free to download. If they want you to use this, they really want you to use this as much as possible. So please take advantage of it. It's a great book. Um, I was at a meeting a couple of years ago and I just want to leave you with this because this, they, they were so proud of this university. It's the University of Coventry. And this is a uh, project meeting for a, uh, uh, that we had there. And it was January. And on this facade, we had solar gain. And the windows here had opened, because they thought they could naturally ventilate it. And on this facade, it was in the shade, and all the heaters were on. And this, I mean, th this is a showcase building. And the instructions for using, the instructions for using this system was all of that. There were the instructions for using the climate system. Please, I don't want to see that ever again. <laughs> this, I mean, we've got to keep it simple. We, we need to do better than this, and this was a showcase. So, um, you know, I, I really do believe that we can keep it simple and still, you know, keep true to the to the aims and goals of the non control ventilation, and, and without compromising that IAQ. So, with that, I'm going to open the floor for any questions. Thank you very much.